Good afternoon. I'm joined today by Professor Steve Paris, uh, who is the National Medical Director of NHS England, uh, and I will shortly be setting out our progress on vaccines. But first, I want to update you on the latest data on the coronavirus response. 2,580,769 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the UK, including 91,206 tests carried out yesterday. 243,303 people have tested positive. That's an increase of 3,142 cases since yesterday. Unfortunately, due to technical issues, Northern Ireland have been unable to process any testing data for Pillar 1 today. Today's daily totals therefore reflect Pillar 1 data for Great Britain only, excluding Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland are looking to resolve this issue as soon as possible, and we will update the data when we can. 10,035 people are in hospital with COVID-19, down 15% from 11,817 this time last week. And sadly, of those tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 34,636 have now died. That's an increase of 170 fatalities since yesterday. Our thoughts are very much with the families and loved ones of those who have lost their lives. Before talking about the work on vaccines and taking questions, I just want to remind everyone of the details of the next phase of our fight against coronavirus. Could I have slide one, please? So first, in order to monitor our progress, we have established a new COVID alert level system with five levels, each relating to the level of threat posed by the virus. The alert level is based primarily on the R value and the number of coronavirus cases. And in turn, that alert level will determine the level of social distancing measures in place. The lower the level, the fewer the measures. The higher the level, the stricter the measures. Throughout the period of lockdown, which started on March the 23rd, we have been at level four. Thanks to you, people across the country, we have collectively helped to bring the R level down. And we are now in a position to begin moving to level three in careful steps. Slide two, please. We have set out the first of three steps we will take to carefully modify the measures, gradually ease the lockdown, and begin to allow people to return to their way of life. But crucially, whilst avoiding what would be a disastrous second peak that overwhelms the NHS. After each step, we will closely monitor the impact of that step on the R and the number of infections and all the available data. And we will only take the next step when we are satisfied that it is safe to do so. As the Prime Minister announced this week, as part of the first step, those who cannot work from home should now speak to their employer about going back to work. You can now spend time outdoors and exercise as often as you like. You can meet one person outside of your household in an outdoor public place, provided you stay two metres apart. Slide three, please. Having taken the first step in carefully adjusting some of the measures and our advice to people on what to do, we have also updated what we are asking people to do, which is to stay alert, control the virus, and save lives. Staying alert for the vast majority of people still means staying at home as much as possible. But there are a range of other actions we're advising people to take. People should stay alert by working from home, if you can, limiting contact with other people, keeping distance if you go out, two meters apart where possible, washing your hands regularly, wearing a face covering when you're in enclosed spaces where it's difficult to be socially distant, for example, in some shops and on public transport. And if you, anyone in your household has symptoms, you all need to self-isolate. Because if everyone stays alert and follows the rules, we can control coronavirus by keeping the R down and reducing the number of infections. This is how we can continue to save lives as we begin as a nation to recover from coronavirus. But in order to definitively conquer this disease, 
we need to find a safe, workable vaccine. Last month, I announced a new vaccine task force to coordinate the efforts of government, academia and industry in the critical mission to find a vaccine. I'm very proud of how quickly our scientists and researchers have come together in their efforts to develop a vaccine that will combat coronavirus. Their work has meant that two of the world's front runners to develop a vaccine are right here in the UK, at the University of Oxford and Imperial College London. The first clinical trial of the Oxford vaccine is progressing well, with all phase one participants having received their vaccine dose on schedule earlier this week. They're now being monitored closely by the clinical trial team. The speed at which Oxford University has designed and organized these complex trials is genuinely unprecedented. Imperial College are also making good progress and we will be looking to move into clinical trials by mid-June with larger scale trials planned to begin in October. So far, the government has invested £47 million in the Oxford and Imperial vaccine programmes. But today, I can announce an additional £84 million of new government funding to help accelerate their work. This new money will help mass produce the Oxford vaccine so that if current trials are successful, we have dosages to start vaccinating the UK population straight away. The funding will also allow Imperial to launch phase three clinical trials for its vaccine later this year. I can also confirm that with government support, Oxford University has finalized a global licensing agreement with AstraZeneca for the commercialization and manufacturing of the Oxford vaccine. This means that if the vaccine is successful, AstraZeneca will work to make 30 million doses available by September for the UK, as part of an agreement at over 100 million doses in total. The UK will be first to get access. And we can also ensure that in addition to supporting people here in the UK, we're able to make the vaccine available to developing countries at the lowest possible cost. To further support our domestic manufacturing capability, last month I announced that the government will accelerate building the UK's first vaccines manufacturing innovation centre, which is based at Harwell in Oxfordshire. And today, I can announce that we will invest up to a further £93 million in the centre, ensuring that it opens in summer 2021, a full 12 months ahead of schedule. The centre, which is already under construction, will have capacity to produce enough vaccine doses to serve the entire UK population in as little as six months. But if, and it is a big if, a successful vaccine is available later this year, we will need to be in a position to manufacture it at scale and quickly. So whilst the centre is being built, the government will establish a rapid deployment facility thanks to a further investment of £38 million to begin coronavirus vaccine manufacturing at scale from this summer. This facility will support efforts to ensure a vaccine is widely available for the UK public as soon as possible. In total, the government has now committed over a quarter of a billion pounds towards developing a vaccine in the UK. But there are no certainties. In spite of the tireless efforts of our scientists, it is possible that we may never find a successful coronavirus vaccine. So we also need to look at other drug treatments and therapeutics for those who get the virus. Treatments that could prevent people progressing to se uh, severe illness or help save lives of those with serious symptoms. Whilst there are currently no drugs in the world uh, that have been clinically proven to treat coronavirus, the government is working with our scientists and medical experts to identify promising candidates. This collaborative UK program known as ACCORD aims to get an early indication of drug treatment's effectiveness in treating coronavirus. And today, I can report that six drugs have now entered initial live clinical trials. If positive results are seen, they will advance into larger scale trials. Our scientists are working tirelessly 
to de develop vaccines and drug treatments, condensing work that would usually take years into months and even weeks. Their drive and dedication inspires us all. And with their help, we will overcome coronavirus. Steve, could I ask you to present the rest of today's slides, please? Thank you, Secretary of State, and good afternoon. Before I present today's data slides, I'd like to provide a brief update on how the NHS has been responding to coronavirus. As I'm sure everybody knows, NHS staff have been working around the clock to respond to the coronavirus pandemic, while at the same time ensuring that essential and urgent services, such as A&Es and specialist care for stroke and heart attacks, continue in as safe a way as possible. But we have been really concerned that a combination of worries about the virus and not wanting to be a burden on NHS staff has meant that some people haven't come forward uh, for care for themselves or their families when they would usually have done so. And we saw that in the record low number of A&E attendances uh, that we saw last uh, month. The majority of the reduced attendances were for lower risk conditions. So for example, sprains were down by 80%, alcohol intoxication by just under 60%, and finger wounds down by just under 50%. But we also worried that within that fall in attendances were people who should have come to A&E and whose health might be put at risk by not doing so. But encouragingly, the latest data suggests that since we launched our Help, you, sorry, our Help Us Help You campaign, the number of people attending with symptoms of heart attacks, uh, for instance, has increased back towards that we, that we would expect ordinarily. Now that doesn't mean that more uh, people are having these problems. It means that the 50% drop in people seeking help has now gone back to normal uh, in the past month. And it shows that the message we've been getting out, use the NHS as normal when you need it, is being heard. But there's no room for complacency. And so we will continue to remind you that the NHS is there for you when you need it. Expectant mums worry about the movement of their babies. Anyone experiencing symptoms of a stroke or, for instance, patients of children with emergency asthma attacks. While at the same time, uh, hospitals have in place the infection control mechanisms in their A&Es and in their acute wards uh, that ensures that everybody uh, can be treated uh, safely. I can now turn uh, to today's data slides. Um, these are in the usual order, starting first uh, with data from uh, the social distancing that we've all been asked to carry out uh, over the last uh, number of weeks. And again, you can see, as we've shown you before, a variety of data from different modes of transport, including public transport, where you will see that there has been a big reduction in rail, uh, in transport in London, uh, and in bus buses uh, throughout the country, uh, also in vehicles, although, as we've noted previously, uh, that has started to increase uh, a bit uh, over the last uh, few weeks. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide uh, takes us to testing. Uh, you have heard today's testing figures, uh, and you will know uh, that uh, there has been a large increase in the amount of testing uh, capacity, uh, and that has been matched with increases in the number of tests that are being carried out each day. That in turn means that we're able to confirm cases of coronavirus by test uh, positive. Uh, and as I've said before, uh, the number of daily confirmed positive cases is staying fairly stable. Uh, and that is in the context of an increasing testing program, which mirrors the observation that the spread of this infection in the community is falling. But as I've, as I've also said previously, the only way we will continue to ensure that happens is by complying with the social distancing measures uh, that we have in place. Next slide. Now we move on to data from hospitals. Uh, and there are two uh, graphs here. The first uh, at the top shows the new daily admissions of patients uh, with coronavirus. And you can see that since uh, a peak in April, uh, the number of patients in our hospitals uh, with coronavirus uh, has uh, steadily fallen and it continues uh, to fall, uh, albeit uh, on a slow uh, decline. You can also see that that's mirrored in our sickest patients who require treatment in our critical care facilities, our ITUs, uh, and you can see that as a proportion uh, there has been a steady fall uh, throughout all parts of the UK uh, over the last uh, number of weeks. 
Uh, and that is also reflected in a fall in the absolute numbers of patients who are in our critical care facilities. Next slide. Um, this uh, shows uh, more generally the number of people uh, in hospital. You can see that uh, there are 10,000, just over 10,000 people uh, in hospital uh, with COVID-19, but that represents a fall of around 1,800 from the same day uh, last week. So steady declines in the overall number of people on, on all wards in our hospitals. And you can see in a regional breakdown uh, that the reduction has been greatest in London, uh, but the fall is also occurring uh, in other parts uh, of the country, uh, although uh, in, at, a slighter, at a slower decline uh, in some areas. And then uh, the next slide, the final slide, uh, shows uh, the sad deaths that we've had from COVID-19. And again, uh, you have heard today's figures from the Secretary of State. Uh, the chart shows those daily figures uh, in all settings. Uh, there is variation from day to day, particularly uh, at weekends uh, where reporting may lag. But the important uh, part of that chart to look at is the seven day rolling average, uh, which has been falling and continues to fall. And once again, this reflects that the social distancing measures that have been put in place and the public's compliance with them uh, has led through to a reduction, uh, not just in hospital admissions, uh, but also in deaths. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I think people watching uh, will, I'm quite sure, be aware that uh, uh, Zoom users are encountering uh, some issues at the moment. And so unfortunately, we won't be able to get any journalists live on screen. Uh, instead, I'll be reading out their, their questions which have been sent in. Um, but let's start with the first uh, question from uh, the public. Peter from County Durham. The R rate in the North East and Yorkshire is now the highest in England. Does the government acknowledge that a phased geographically based lifting of the lockdown would have been a better option? Um, thank you uh, very much for that, uh, Peter. Uh, look, what I would say is that, um, uh, you know, we have taken a whole of UK approach uh, to this, this whole issue. Uh, and of course, um, as national monitoring becomes a much more precise and larger scale, uh, one can look to see what you might do at a level of devolved uh, administrations or indeed uh, regions. But I think it is too soon uh, for any of that right now. Uh, and uh, that is why we continue to take a whole of UK approach uh, on this. Uh, Steve, do you want to comment any further on R? Yes, I think that's uh, exactly uh, the point. Um, there will be variation uh, between different parts of the country that occurs uh, naturally in epidemics. We see that, for instance, in the flu season uh, each winter. Uh, I think what's important going forward, as the Secretary of State has said, is that increasingly we will be able to measure R direct. The Office for National Statistics this week uh, provided the first publication of their direct testing of a random uh, sample of the population. And over the next few weeks, as that uh, data is available longitudinally, week on week, and as that program expands, we will have much better information of the directly measured R rate rather than our rate that is derived from uh, models uh, and other observations. And that, I think, will give us a clearer picture uh, of exactly how the infection is progressing in different parts of the country. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the next uh, question is from a member of the public, from Miriam from Solihull. Uh, let me uh, read that out. It said, why are visitors from France and UK uh, to be exempt from the proposed uh, quarantine rules. Um, what well, can I just say that, that firstly, I think what uh, we've been very keen on as uh, as part of the whole process is to uh, keep the R rate uh, down, uh, and it's really important that we do that. We keep this below uh, one. Uh, that is why uh, we are going to be introducing quarantining measures, uh, particularly uh, important now that the transmission rate domestically has has come down. Um, and I just want to be clear on this, is that I think there's a trade-off between uh, the, the health of the nation and the health of the economy. Um, uh, Miriam makes uh, reference to, to France. Um, there have been discussions between the Prime Minister and President Macron. Uh, we are, uh, you know, when details become available, we will set them out. Um, but what I would say is that what is important to realize, the reason we're going to be introducing uh, 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 quarantine measures, uh, with some uh, limited exceptions, is precisely what, because we want to protect the UK population now that they have uh, made sacrifices and managed to get the R rate below one. Um, right, I think we now, let's move on to the, uh, the journalists. I think the first question is from uh, Vicky Young uh, from the BBC. Uh, 
Vicky has asked the following question, which is that, are you guaranteeing that a test track and trace system for teachers and pupils will be in place by the 1st of June when many primary school pupils are due to return to classrooms? Um, I think, uh, firstly, I, I want to thank uh, teachers because uh, they have uh, managed to keep schools open uh, for vulnerable children and indeed for the children of essential workers uh, during this pandemic period, and they absolutely deserve our, our thanks. Um, we have set out, the, the uh, Education Secretary has set out uh, a, uh, you know, how one would operate in a school setting, and safety is absolutely paramount. We want to make sure that uh, pupils are sh safe and, of course, teachers are safe as well. And that's why we've set out measures uh, you know, talking about the fact that we have uh, smaller numbers of class sizes, uh, we limit uh, uh, contact, we make sure that uh, we also ensure much more regular cleaning of surfaces, uh, that we uh, have children washing their hands, so that whole issue around hygiene. Um, that is how we're going to make sure that we keep uh, pupils and uh, uh, teachers safe, uh, and we will continue to have those discussions with teachers. What I would say again is that we've seen in the last few days uh, some of the biggest academy chains are uh, saying that they will look to open if the government says it is safe uh, earliest by the 1st of June to get primary school kids who are in a reception year one and year six uh, back into school. Uh, but absolutely, safety is paramount. Shall we have the second question from the media? It's from Shahab Khan at ITV. Um, we are starting to see regional differences in the response to coronavirus. Some regions will not be taking the government's advice and opening schools. Are you concerned about the regional discrepancies? Are you happy to encourage different regional responses? Well, can I just build on the answer that I gave uh, to the question from Vicky Young at the BBC? That the reason uh, that um, we, of course, uh, have said that we want to see primary school uh, children back first is because we all know that early learning is absolutely vital. Those early years are absolutely vital in terms of developing cognitive skills and emotional skills. And uh, you know, this is aimed at, at, at children who uh, are benefiting from getting those core skills of reading, writing, uh, arithmetic. Uh, and that is why we have set out that at the earliest we would do this uh, by, by June. Uh, we will continue to have discussions uh, with uh, teachers, head teachers. We want everyone to feel safe. But what we have set out is something that we're talking about for across uh, the whole country. And as I said, there are uh, academy chains across the country who have said that they will look to return uh, primary school kids to school when the government says it is safe to do so. Sh um, I don't know, Steve. I don't think comment? I've got anything to add on that uh, question. OK, very good. M the next question is uh, from Charlotte Ivers at Talk Radio. Uh, it's um, uh, for, for Stephen Powers. One of the government's five tests for lifting lockdown is that any supply issues with PPE and tests are resolved uh, and the NHS can meet future demand. Are we there yet? And if not, what is your best estimate for when we will be there? Uh, so thank you, Charlotte. So I think there are three separate questions there, uh, one on PPE, one on testing, and then on the uh, more general question of the NHS capacity to meet uh, COVID-19 uh, going forward. Uh, so on the first two, of course, uh, government is leading on the procurement of PPE and on the provision of tests. Uh, the situation with PPE has uh, gradually improved uh, over the last uh, few weeks, uh, but uh, I do understand that it continues uh, to be a challenge in terms of uh, international procurement uh, at a time when many, many countries are sourcing uh, PPE. Uh, what's important, as I've often said, is that for frontline staff, uh, that they uh, do have the confidence that they uh, are supplied with the PPE that they uh, need uh, to, uh, to treat their patients uh, and uh, the people in their care uh, safely, uh, to keep the patients safe and themselves safe. So I'm confident that, uh, that the government is addressing that, but I don't underestimate the challenges going forward. Uh, on testing, as, as you have heard, uh, there has been an increase in the capacity for testing. Prime Minister has set another ambition uh, within the NHS. We are doing our part uh, in the NHS labs as part of that testing programme. We have been expanding uh, the availability of tests to those both that we look after and to our staff. 
So to give you some insight into that, uh, we have been uh, for several weeks now testing all patients who present to our hospitals uh, with an emergency, whether or not they have uh, symptoms of COVID-19, so that we can absolutely ensure that we've picked up all people who are infected who are coming into hospital. Uh, we have uh, recently issued uh, guidance in the last uh, week uh, around elective admissions, so people who will be coming into hospital not as an emergency but for planned procedures uh, and how we can ensure that together with uh, testing they can uh, come in uh, COVID-free and safely. We have been testing staff and indeed all uh, other, other key workers, but particularly staff in the NHS who are symptomatic uh, with uh, COVID-19 symptoms. But we have also asked our hospitals as capacity increases uh, to increasingly test staff who have no symptoms who have, or who have very mild symptoms uh, to ensure that we are picking up as many uh, potential cases as possible. So that is how in the NHS we have been able to use our testing capacity to increase uh, our testing and our understanding of how this uh, virus is transmitted. And then finally on NHS future demand, so I think one of the things that we should be proudest of is that our NHS staff have acted magnificently uh, over the last uh, two months to ensure that NHS capacity has always been there for the surge that we have seen in coronavirus patients. At no time did we run out of capacity, either in our general wards uh, or in our intensive care units. And the graphs I showed you earlier showed how we saw that increase in patients, both in wards and in ITUs, but at no time uh, did we uh, run out of our ability to treat people. And we, indeed, we all, always had spare capacity. There were always uh, a large number of intensive care beds uh, that could have been brought on if we needed them, including those in the Nightingale. And I'm confident going forward uh, that we will be working with the NHS to ensure that that remains the case uh, and that we will have capacity in place uh, to ensure that uh, we will be able uh, to cope with uh, patients who unfortunately need to be admitted with COVID-19. Uh, COVID but of course the other part of that is to ensure that everybody in the public, that we all comply with the social distancing measures that we are being asked to comply with at any particular point in this epidemic, because it's only by doing that and keeping the number, the R number below one, so the level of infection low and falling uh, in the population, uh, that that capacity can be there, but won't need to be uh, to be used. So success for us is capacity uh, that we build in to manage uh, any surge, but uh, not having to use that because the R is below one and transmission rates are low, and we all have our place to play in that. Great, thank you for that, Steve. Uh, the next question is from Francis Elliott at the Times. Um, Will the UK have enough capacity for the domestic production of the vaccine by the time one is developed, or will we be relying to some degree on other nations to supply? Uh, well, Francis, hopefully uh, the statement I made uh, has uh, made that uh, clear. Um, we um, have set in place uh, the, um, uh, a rapid deployment facility as well, so that um, we are ready to start producing in, in the summer. Of this year and I've also announced uh, today the um, agreement that has been reached between AstraZeneca and Oxford uh, to make sure that um, uh, by September we have um, up to 30 million uh, vaccine doses available uh, as part of a hundred million in total. Should we have the next question? Uh, it's from Martin Brown uh, at The Express. Will the government consider changing or lifting the current 14-day quarantine restrictions on arrivals to help boost the economy? And does the Secretary of State agree with Heathrow boss John Holland Kay, who said today that if the right measures are put in place, a free flow of flights to and from the UK could resume in the next month or so? Um, well, Martin, this question, obviously, uh, a, a variation of it was raised by, by Miriam from um, Solihull. Um, uh, again, I think w what I would say is that what uh, is absolutely vital and um, what is very important for us to realise is that uh, the health of the nation uh, is not in some way um, uh, different from making sure that we uh, take care of the health of the economy. And in fact, all the measures that we have taken uh, so far is about protecting lives and also livelihoods uh, as well. Uh, and I recognise 
uh, that um, you know, quarantining measures will put restrictions on businesses being uh, able to travel, business people being able to travel. Uh, we will be setting out shortly uh, the exemptions. Uh, and of course, one of the exemptions we have talked about is uh, uh, people who are uh, bringing freight in, so freight drivers. Um, but the key thing right now is to make sure that we keep that R down. And I think in the, in, in the comments that uh, uh, John Holland Kay made this morning, which I also listened into, uh, I think he understood uh, the reason that we were, we were doing this. Uh, and what I would say is during this period, we've of course also uh, found more remote ways of, of working. Uh, and uh, it's going to be quite interesting to see how businesses, uh, particularly service type businesses, adjust to that going forward. Thank you for that. So I think we've got a final question from Rupanjana Datta from the Asian Voice. Uh, one of our uh, headline stories highlighted the language and cultural barriers when it comes to contact tracing, which means recruitment within the BAME community is essential. What are you doing to address this recruitment channel, uh, challenge? Uh, Rupanjana, um, uh, if I can just say in terms of the, the issue around contact tracing, We've now got over 17,000 people recruited to that. Uh, we are um, uh, very much on target uh, to make sure that we have the right number of people. Uh, and actually, this is also a question of making sure that people from across all communities are able to come forward uh, for this really vital task uh, as well. And I know one of the, the big concerns uh, has been within the BMA community is uh, being disproportionately impacted by the, the virus. There is work that is ongoing uh, in terms of looking at studies uh, on that. Uh, and perhaps I can pass over to uh, Steve to comment a little bit on that particular point. But just to say in terms of contact tracing, I think there is a, that's a very important point and we need to make sure that uh, all communities are represented uh, as part of the team that does the contract tracing. Thank you very much. So, so on, on that specific point, I, I do agree that it is important uh, that as we move to a uh, contact tracing to a track and trace uh, plan uh, and, and that gets uh, rolled out, uh, that it is available to all uh, and that we pay particular emphasis uh, to those communities uh, that for whatever reason uh, may uh, not uh, always engage um, in, in a track and trace or difficult to reach communities for whatever reasons. And uh, Ruben Jana has there highlighted um, issues around language and cultural barriers, but there are other uh, examples in other communities as well where there may be other uh, barriers that, uh, that uh, need to be taken into account. So I, I absolutely agree that it's important that uh, that is thought of uh, and that we have uh, representational um, uh, recruitment uh, so that uh, we can uh, effectively uh, work with, uh, with various communities. Uh, on the point about the Bain community being affected by coronavirus, um, as I've said before, and I know others standing here have said, that's a really, really important uh, question that we take incredibly serious. I do as a clinician and as a doctor. Public Health England, as I'm sure you know, have been asked to look into this, and that work is ongoing to understand uh, the particular risk factors uh, that uh, the Bain community uh, may have uh, for coronavirus and specifically with the NHS of course where we have a high proportion of staff, doctors, nurses and other clinicians from the Bain community. Uh, it's really important as an employer, as a, as a healthcare system, uh, that we are able uh, to look after those staff, to reassure them, uh, to risk assess them individually uh, and to ensure that we put in place the measures that might be required to keep them safe. And it's for that reason that we've been working uh, with independent experts and through NHS employers. Uh, we issued guidance to NHS employers only last week, uh, additional guidance on, on how they might approach uh, that risk assessment uh, of, uh, of all staff, but in particular uh, members of the Bain community who do such a great job for us uh, in the NHS. Steve, thank you very much. Uh, we've come to the end of the press conference and could I once again thank uh, all members of the public for everything that uh, you are doing uh, individually uh, to ensure that we keep the um, R rate down. Uh, and I just end with uh, our overall message, which is please stay alert, control the virus and save lives. Thank you.